So welcome back to session number two of the sixth day. Uh, we are lucky to have before us Professor Sudarshan, who will be talking in the area of database security. I am sure most of you have studied this course, databases. Some of you may be teaching it. And in that connection, you might have had the opportunity to hear about uh, the, the textbook on databases, probably the most well-known book in the subject. Um, Professor uh, Sudarshan has, uh, is a faculty member in this department. In fact, he's the head of this department and has been one of the most dynamic heads. So uh, with that brief introduction, uh, over to Professor Sudarshan. Thank you, Professor Bernard, and good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we'll be talking about database security. Given that uh, we have just about an hour and a half or even less to cover a pretty vast area, I'm going to just be scratching the surface. Uh, so I'll start by motivating database security. So what is database security? There is data in a database. And there are certain people who are authorized to view the data. There are certain people who are authorized to update certain parts of the data. And data or database security is basically protecting the data from malicious items to either steal, that is view the data, or to modify the data, which can have other repercussions. For example, uh, adding money to your bank balance without actually having deposited money. Now, why is protection of data getting, uh, in, you know, it's not just important, it's critical to life today in some sense, uh, to modern day life. And that's because uh, there are just so many things which are online these days. If you have a bank account, and every one of us does, all our uh, information about the money we have in our bank is stored online. If you own shares, it's a, a DMAT form and stored online. If you use a credit card, all your expenditure is online. If you, when you want to make a purchase with a credit card, obviously it's contacting an online database. Similarly, your salary, income tax, uh, if you are a student, your uh, admission information, your uh, marks and grades. If you own a house, for example, the land records now are increasingly online. It's still mostly on paper, but a lot of it is going online because of fraud on paper. Uh, then there are licenses for various things, driving licenses, uh, taxi licenses, auto rickshaw licenses, and so on, which are also going online uh, to a large extent because of fraud on paper. And then there are medical records, which uh, as of now in India are not very much online, but the trend is clear. Uh, increasingly, doctors are going to write your prescriptions on uh, tablets, not the medical kind, but the uh, iPad or Android uh, tablets. And that's where your uh, health history is going to reside, on, online. The tablet is just the interface. So pretty much any information about you, which is critical to your life and well-being and your wealth is online. So that's from your perspective as an individual. From an organizational perspective, similarly, uh, data is key. If you don't uh, have and if you don't protect your data, you're in trouble. So now when there is uh, such important data out there, obviously people are going to try to hack and get access to it. And there are various ways in which uh, this can be done. And this is just a small, very small sample of headlines, meaning the headlines are really the biggest data breaches that have occurred. The smaller ones never even make it into newspapers, let alone become headlines. So here is just a small sample. I've tried to pick some from across different years. Just a few days back, uh, there was a report about Chinese hackers breaking into the US federal employee database. It's not clear what information they got, but there's a lot of potential for using that information to target individuals who have high security clearance. And if you have security attacks that target individuals, you can put more effort and break in and thereby get into high security government databases. A uh, few months back, uh, there was a break into eBay account information. Uh, eBay is uh, the mother of OLX and other similar things. Uh, it's there in India but it's really big uh, elsewhere. So eBay's uh, account information, including usernames and passwords, were compromised. And this means that people can access uh, eBay accounts, make purchases, spend money, and so on. An even more insidious attack happened uh, not so long ago in December, where uh, the Target store, that's one of the biggest chains. It's like you heard of Walmart. 
target is a slightly more upscale version of Walmart. It's a little smaller overall, but it's a huge chain. And hackers broke in and got access to uh, credit and debit card information along with PIN numbers, which is extremely dangerous. Uh, that particular one didn't hack into the database. They actually hacked into the point of sale terminals. But uh, uh, equivalently, if they got into the database, they could have got similar information. A little bit earlier, in 2010, there was a big article on, which was called The Great Cyber Heist, talking about how billions of dollars had been stolen from banks. And it turns out that the key technique used by those people who broke into the banks and uh, credit card organizations was something called SQL injection, which you saw probably uh, yesterday or day before. And you must have had a lab which showed uh, what you could do with SQL injection or SQL injection. I'll be using the word SQL and SQL interchangeably. Uh, people in the field use both of these. So you've uh, seen how uh, to do SQL injection. And it turns out that the repercussions can be enormous. In this case, billions of dollars were at stake. And uh, the number of places that are vulnerable to SQL injection is unfortunately enormous. People have been very uh, careless programmers. Uh, in the early days, uh, back in the early 2000s, people didn't realize the risk and coded uh, dangerous things without realizing it. Soon after that, people understood the risk. Uh, this was uh, taught in courses. So uh, the current generation of programmers ought to know very well what are the risks of SQL injection. Unfortunately, many people still don't. And there are still many bugs out there, uh, which people are creating today, not to mention a lot of legacy code, uh, which has these vulnerabilities. Uh, coming closer home to India, there have been many such examples. In 2009, there was a thing about medical records, which were sent to India for digitization being put up for sale. Um, what uh, people would do with it and why they would pay money for it, I'm not very sure. But clearly, there was a market for it. And this had a lot of repercussions because it gave India a bad name and would have diverted a lot of uh, the uh, BPO uh, market away from India, causing economic harm to India. In 2010, there was a fake uh, registration certificate racket at the road uh, transport thing in Hyderabad. Um, I believe that people would steal cars. And then you need a, a RC book to sell the car. And they had broken into the uh, RTA and could generate those things. And then they could sell the stolen cars. And a, a little bit earlier still, uh, in Delhi, they had uh, an estimate of, they had issued about, I think, 1 lakh auto rickshaw licenses. And a sample showed that there were at least 2 lakh autos on the road. So half the autos on the road were illegal. They were not paying taxes. And the government decided to clamp down on it. So they said that this is happening because of paper records. We will now have everything online. And all licenses have to be renewed. And everything is going to be done on a database online. A very nice idea. Uh, they went through with it. And at the end of it, they found that in, from 2 lakhs, the number of autos had come down to 1.5 lakhs. But there were still only 1 lakh licenses. That means half of the licenses were fake even after putting it online. So then they investigated what had happened. And it turned out that somebody had uh, accessed the database and wiped out the records after a bunch of autos had been registered, allowing fresh registrations against the same license number. Um, so then uh, two autos with the same license number could uh, exist in the city without anybody knowing. And they only paid tax once. So this kind of fraud is uh, common and dangerous. So if you are a database administrator, this is what the world looks like to you. Here is the data sitting in the middle. And here are all these people trying to hack into the data. And it's your job to protect the data. And obviously, you would be extremely scared about what is going on. The uh, amount of money at stake has gone from literally, uh, you know, if in dollar terms, uh, from uh, hundreds of thousands to millions to now billions. It's an enormous increase in scale. So I'm not going to be able to cover everything in this uh, vast space, as I told you. But I'm going to cover a few things. And for each of these, I'm going to give you just a little bit of overview of what is going on. And then I will leave it to you to dig deeper into these areas, if you're interested. So first of all, we will cover the levels of data security. And uh, below are the actual levels. So I'm going to go into each of these levels in more detail in the, the physical uh, data security. Uh, I'm going to talk about authorization, application level security, 
uh, protection against certain other attacks such as insider attacks. And then I am going to talk about two topics which are more at the research level uh, today. Uh, one of which is security with outsourced databases and the other is privacy. Um, I don't think you have had uh, privacy as a topic here. Uh, I have a list of topics down here. So again, privacy is a very big area. I, I won't get into much detail, but I'll give you a very quick issue of some of the issues, quick, quick overview of the issues. Okay, so this is what a modern information system looks like. You have users who are connecting over the net. Um, now here it shows a very old uh, drawing of somebody with a CRT monitor. Uh, today, of course, uh, it's not just desktop computers here, but mobile devices are actually dominating. But be that as it may, they usually connect over the internet to an application program which is sitting somewhere. And that application program is going to access data in a database. The database system itself is running on top of an operating system such as Windows, Linux. Increasingly, this database is not a centralized database but is actually uh, something which is highly parallel. Um, and uh, underlying all that is the actual disks and the hardware uh, on which this data is stored. So now coming to uh, the different levels of data security um, against which uh, any organization which has an information system has to be aware of all these levels and take precautions against breaches at any of these levels. The highest level is humans. Now obviously there are some humans in the organization who have access to all the data. If this human can be subverted, uh, then there is a problem. Um, now, how do you protect against uh, such things? That's not an easy problem. I mean, there's no single solution to it. But anybody building a system has to uh, figure out ways of it. And we will talk a little bit about this. Now, the next level, the human is connecting to the application program over the network. And there are a lot of opportunities for uh, breaches over here. I'm not going to talk about it because you have been covering that and will be covering that in a lot more detail in this course. Further down is the database application program. And we are going to uh, spend a fair amount of time on security at this level. And the application program in turn connects to the database system. So we will uh, talk about security here. Now the database itself typically runs on top of an OS. If somebody can subvert the OS, they can get access to data. Uh, again, we are not going to get into that, uh, although that's an important problem. And then finally, there's the physical level. Now uh, we are going to take talk a little bit about protecting data at the physical level uh, coming up. So I'm going to actually cover these in reverse order. I'm going to start with the bottom and then go upwards, uh, roughly speaking. So uh, let's look at the physical level security. Now, uh, you must have heard about uh, Snowden and how he copied data from uh, the information systems and is now busily embarrassing the US. Uh, many of us probably think it's a good thing uh, because uh, he revealed uh, lot of unsavory things that the US government had been doing. But obviously, the US government doesn't view it that way. And um, you know they would want to prevent uh, something like this happening again. So uh, in this case, Snowden had access to unencrypted data, and he copied it to a USB key. We are not going to deal with how to, to prevent that kind of access. Um, but the question is, what if somebody had data in a laptop? And this is a common situation in a business. Management often needs a low level data to do analysis. If somebody steals the laptop, then they've got access to the data. If somebody manages to break into your hotel room, copy out your disk and leave without you knowing it, they have got access to your data. So that's a serious risk. Uh, so how can you protect against uh, this kind of a risk? Similarly, if you had a USB key with data which is lost, and this happened again to the US, uh, apparently, uh, there was a lot of military data on USB keys in Afghanistan. And USB keys are extremely easy to steal, obviously. So these things were being sold in the market in Pakistan uh, containing uh, critical military information. So how do you protect data which is stored on these things and which has uh, leaked out? And the obvious way is to increase, encrypt the database at the storage level. So most commercial databases today uh, support encryption of the entire database. Uh, so if anybody gets a copy of the disk, if they don't have the key, then they cannot uh, access the data. So that is whole database encryption. Now whole database encryption is uh, good, but um, there are certain situations where that 
is either uh, too high overhead or is uh, not sufficient and the next level of security is column encryption. Uh, so, this is uh, very commonly used for sensitive data. So, supposing you have an account with um, let us say Flipkart, Flipkart has your credit card number and that is considered sensitive information. Now, if they store it in plain text, if somebody gets access to it, there is a problem. So, instead what they do is the database itself may not be encrypted, but the column containing the credit card numbers is stored in an encrypted fashion. And if Flipkart application program wants to access the data, it has to decrypt it. So, as long as the database uh, is kept physically separate from the application program containing the decryption password, uh, then if somebody steals the disk, they are not going to get access to the sensitive information at least. So, this has lower overhead than full database encryption and is used quite a bit. There are issues with this still, uh, for example, key management. If somebody manages to steal the key, then uh, they have access to your data. Uh, but it is still a very important aspect of security and most commercial databases do support both of these levels today, whole database and uh, column. You could also do file system encryption. Uh, most operating systems today support some form of uh, encryption of a whole file system. So, you could do that too. So, now uh, encryption of sensitive information such as credit card numbers is not just a good idea, but it is actually the law in the US under the HIPAA law, uh, there are a certain uh, sensitive information which by law cannot be stored in plain text in the database. So, you have to encrypt it. So, now let us move up one notch and come to the database and application programs. So, here uh, security is not just about preventing access to data because you do need access to data here, but it is about authentication and authorization. So, you need to authenticate users to know who the user is and then you have authorizations to specify to the database what a particular user is allowed to do. So, we are going to get into more detail here. So, there are many types of authorizations. At the application program level, there is usually a screen level authorization which controls which users to get, uh, get to see which screen. So, a typical application program has a very large number of screens, each of which allows certain things to be done. So, uh, most application programs would have an authorization mechanism built in which says that this user or this category of users can get access to these screens. In addition, uh, the screens themselves will take certain parameters directly from the user login. So, if a user is logged in, they get the user ID. So, a screen which shows your salary for example, uh, would directly take from the login your uh, employee ID and you will only get to see your own salary, not anybody else's salary. So, uh, the screen enforces that it, um, the salary of the currently logged in person is made available. So, that is the screen and application program level authorization. Now, if you go down into the database, uh, the application program itself connects to a database and does various things to it. And so, there has been a lot of work on authorization in the database. Anybody who has taken a database course would have probably seen some of these things. And uh, here are some examples of the types of authorization um, or these actually technically these are privileges. You have a read privilege, insert, update, delete and a variety of other privileges. So, now uh, this is encoded in the SQL language. The uh, so entire authorization mechanism built into SQL and this is based on four different notions. There is a notion of a privilege. So, I just told you what are the kinds of privileges, read, update, insert, delete and so on. And then there are objects on which these privileges can be granted. So, in a typical database, the object could be a relation or it could be one or more columns of a relation. So, you can have access to column A, but not to column B. And then there are users and roles. Uh, so, now uh, what is a role? It is a uh, it's a, it's a notion of the kind of work that a particular uh, set of users might be doing. So, let us say a role is a manager. So, if you look at this example here, uh, it says grant select on employee to manager. Employee is a table and manager is a particular role. So, all people with the role manager will now get uh, the ability to run a select query on employees table and see all the roles in that table. So, uh, the objects as I told you could be relations, columns, but it could also be views 
toad procedures and so on. So there's a fairly extensive set of objects on which you can grant, grant privileges. And there's actually more kinds of privileges. For example, for stored procedure, you may not be able to read the stored procedure's definition, but you may be allowed to execute the stored procedure. You might be able to execute the stored procedure as yourself, or you might be given the authorization to execute the stored procedure as the user who created the procedure. In other words, you may not directly have access to a particular table which that procedure uses. But when the procedure is executed, it runs as the user who created that procedure and can therefore access the table. So there are a lot of such functionalities built, in, built into SQL. Um, in the current SQL standard, however, the authorization on objects is not at the level of rows. So you cannot say that a user can access this row of a relation, but not that row. And I'll come back to this limitation later. There has been some work to uh, remove this limitation. Uh, then there's also a way to grant roles to users. For example, grant manager to Bernard, because he's managing this code. Now, I'm not going to get into more details of authorization in SQL. It's uh, fairly standard. If you've done a database course, you would know it. If not, see any database textbook. Now, let's come back to the application level. Uh, as I said, uh, the application connects to the database and executes queries and updates in there. So how does the database know who is connecting to it? It's a connection which is coming across the net, a socket is open. But how does the database know who is opening this? And typically, this is done by using a password, a database password, which is stored in the application program. And so the database has no idea who are the users out here. All it knows is that there is a single user uh, under which the application program is accessing the database. Now, the application program obviously is comprehensive. It has to do various functionalities on the database. Therefore, it has to have complete privileges on the database. It should be able to update any data, read any data in the database. So what does this mean? Uh, it means that if this password leaks, first of all, you're in trouble. But even more important, if somebody is able to fool the application program, is able to subvert the security of the application program, the database level security is useless. It's completely useless because the database only sees one application program user, and it has no idea that uh, you know, uh, this particular update that came is not a legal update, but rather is a result of a breach of security here. The database cannot find out. So that's a more serious problem. We'll come back to this. Um, so it turns out that the biggest problem of security uh, today by far is not inside the database, but really at the application program. Um, so poor coding of applications, in particular SQL injection, which you saw uh, I think yesterday or day before, is one of the biggest problems here. But there are many more. Uh, for a, a example, um, application might easily forget to implement an authorization check on a particular screen. So there was a famous case a few years back. Uh, there's a site called applyyourself.com, which is used to handle uh, applications to various universities in the US. It's a site which many universities use. Uh, so what happened is that uh, in there, students were supposed to see the results only after a certain date. So universities get time till a particular date to uh, update their admissions information. After that date, the uh, results are made available to students. Now what happened is uh, they used some interface uh, for universities and uh, others to see the data. And that interface did not have the time limit. And uh, they had a similar interface for users, which also did not implement the time check. And this particular thing was not publicized to users. But it was there on the system, unfortunately. And as luck would have it, somebody chanced on this interface. I don't know how they got information about it. But what they did is they uh, typed that um, uh, extra suffix to the URL on the browser. And lo and behold, they could connect to that interface and see the results before the results were declined. Unfortunately, this could only be done if you were already logged into the system. Uh, well, fortunately or unfortunately. Unfortunately for the students, I would say. Because some students came to hear of this. and. They said, hey, I want to see my results early. Uh, you know, what's a big deal? Uh, nobody is being hurt by this. So they went ahead and used it to see the results. But unfortunately for the students, 
uh, applyyourself.com was logging what was going on. So it was able to trace all the students who had accessed data uh, through this interface. And it went ahead and turned over that information to the universities. And many universities actually canceled the admission of students who did this. So it hurt those students quite a lot. Um, the university said that, hey, these students are, are doing unethical things. We don't want to admit them. So that's a big impact on those students. So it's very important to code the application to avoid these kinds of uh, problems. There are, uh, but of course, this is easier uh, said than done. Uh, way back, about 11 years ago, we had a workshop on data-based security here in IIT Bombay. And there was a student who built an interface for registering for this workshop. And there were some people in a company in Pune who were working on security. One of them said, hey, let me try to see if this particular uh, registration application is vulnerable. And uh, what happened is, uh, unfortunately, it was. He was able to see the passwords by a small trick, uh, which was well known. And uh, he could have accessed our database and done anything to it. Of course, he didn't. He told us about it. Uh, but that's another example of application vulnerability. So let's come back to SQL injection, which you saw earlier. I'm just going to remind you briefly about this um, before going into techniques for avoiding SQL injection attacks. So here is a form uh, which takes a username and a password. And here is a badly written application which tries to authenticate the user as follows. It has a query, select user info from users where user ID equal to, and note the construction here. The query has a string plus uh, user ID equals, and then there is a username which is typed in here, and then um, there is a uh, and password equal to, and a password which is typed in here. So now, uh, this username was supposed to be, uh, this particular one I think is missing some quotes. Uh, there should have been, uh, th there's a typo on this slide. Uh, there should have been an extra pair of quotes before and after username, and similarly before and after password, so that in the SQL query which you get, the username and password are enclosed in quotes, which is a SQL uh, language requirement, that you have quotes around these identifiers. Um, so now, a malicious user types in a username that looks like that, the following, XYZ quote, and then dash dash. Now what is this doing? As I said, there should have been a quote here. I, 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 as I said, there's a small mistake in this slide. Um, so now, there would have been an opening quote for username. So it would have been something like user ID equal to quote, and then XYZ close quote. That closes the string. So in a SQL query, what comes after the string? Well, the remaining SQL uh, constructs. In this case, dash dash. Now what is dash dash in SQL? It's a comment. So what is the effective query that is run? Select user info from users, where user ID equal to x, y, z, and then the rest is commented out. That's it. That's the query. And this uh, query is going to return a result. Now, normally, if the user had not hacked it, the query would return a result only if the username password matched in the user's table. So if a user gave a wrong password, it wouldn't allow login. But now the password check has been commented out, so the user is in trivially by just adding a quote and a dash dash. How much easier can it be to break into a system? So this is the problem with SQL uh, injection attacks. They are extremely easy to execute. So how do you write code to avoid this? Well, we will see that in a bit. As I told you, uh, the great cyber heist, which, where millions of dollars were compromised, was initiated totally from SQL injection. Uh, a little bit later, uh, Sony had online games for their um, uh, gaming console, PlayStation, and somebody hacked into it, again using SQL injection, and was able to get credit card information, login, password, all kinds of information uh, about the entire set of users. So it hurt the company enormously. So SQL injection is extremely dangerous. So how do you protect against SQL injection? Now, all languages which are used to connect to databases have a notion of prepared statements, or there are a few other ways. Uh, but prepared statements are by far the easiest way of protecting against SQL. So I'm going to spend a few minutes um, 
talking about the JDBC API specifically. Uh, whatever I tell you here has its equivalents in other APIs. So if you use PHP or Python or anything else, uh, you would use a corresponding method over there. So all these APIs for accessing databases have the following model. You open a connection to the database, you create a statement object, and then you execute queries using that statement object. And then there's an exception mechanism to handle errors. I'm not going to cover that. So that's the basic model. So here is a sample piece of JDBC code which shows the overall thing. And in the next slide are the details which we are going to focus on. So this is kind of the wrapper for what we are doing. So don't worry about the specific syntax here. Uh, it's loading some Oracle driver first and opening a connection to this URL, db.el.edu for 2000, connecting to db with the user ID and password that were passed in here using a particular protocol, uh, JDBC Oracle Fin. So all that is not of concern to us for security. The connection is open in this statement. And now, from that connection, we create a statement. And the statement is used to do the actual work, which is in the next slide. After the work is done, you close the statement, close the connection, and wrap up. So that's a typical model for uh, accessing a database from JDBC. Now here's the actual code which uses that statement uh, variable to execute whatever is required. So if you want to update the database, you could write a, a thing like this, statement dot execute update, and here is a SQL string. Insert into instructor values, blah, blah, blah. So a new tuple is added to instructor. And uh, that's an update. Similarly, if you want to execute a query, you could say result set r set equal to statement dot execute query, and here you have a, a small SQL query being executed. And then here is a loop which loops over the result set and prints out the uh, results of that query. Let's not worry too much about the details of the syntax, but let's focus on this particular thing here. You have a statement dot execute query and a string. And the problem is if a string is created using input from the user, then we have a problem. So here is a string uh, which is being typed in. Uh, it says, select star from instructor where id equal to single quote plus user id plus single quote. So whatever user id is typed here is enclosed in single quotes. Now the double quotes are the Java language um, uh, string terminators and the single quotes are the string terminators within SQL. So this is how this particular query is constructed. Uh, so here the quotes have been done properly. Sorry for the mistake in the earlier slide. So now, um, if the user, instead of typing a real valid user ID, types something like just a single quote directly, semicolon, delete from R. This is the example of uh, user, a SQL injection you have seen. Then the query becomes select star from instructor, where ID equal to quote, that quote came from here, and then a quote which came from the use, this thing, the, what the user typed in semicolon, delete from R, semicolon, and then there would be a quote after that, which is added here, which might be a syntax error. You could put a dash dash here to uh, remove that quote also. So now this is uh, going to run two SQL statements, select star and then delete. Uh, so that's a second kind of vulnerability. So now, how do you find out if a particular application is vulnerable? It turns out to be very easy. In fact, there are automated scripts for doing this. Um, so you have tools which will type in strings which look like this, quote, star, star, star into a box. Why star, star, star? Because that's not a valid uh, SQL statement. It will cause a uh, SQL error. And uh, the quote will terminate a string if you had a vulnerable application. And then this will cause an exception. And that exception will immediately cause the uh, application to output a message. In some cases, the application actually outputs the entire error message. And it turns out that the error message often has very valuable information to the hacker. What kind of information? It tells the user what was the query. It tells the user what were the tables in the database. It tells them what are the columns. So using this, the hacker can now get more information and probe deeper into the database, with starting with no knowledge about the database. So that's another problem. Printing error messages uh, which the database has thrown to users is uh, uh, actually a security hole. Many applications do this. 
even today. So, how do you prevent this kind of an attack? And the simplest technique is to use prepared statements. So, how does a prepared statement work? Well, it looks like this. Uh, this is the JDBC prepared statement. You say con dot prepare statement and you pass the SQL query, but in here you do not pass any values which are taken from the user. So, instead you put question marks for each value which is going to come from the user. So, this is a fixed string. Select star from instructor where id equal to question mark is a fixed string. It cannot be modified by user input. However, there is a question mark indicating that this is a point where some user input is going to be provided. And the next line here p statement dot set string 1 to user id. 1 meaning the first question mark in this query string that is being set to user id. Um, and then you execute this prepared statement. So, what this particular thing does is the uh, set string looks for quotes in the string which is being passed in and adds escape character. So, in particular if the user typed in quote semicolon delete from our blah blah what is going to happen? The set string is going to add a backslash before the quote which the user typed in. So, now a backslash quote is treated by SQL as a actual quote in the midst of a string. So, now this becomes the entire string. The string becomes single quote semicolon delete. So, id equal to single quote semicolon delete blah blah which of course, is not going to give anything useful. And so, this protects the uh, system from SQL injection. So, this is by far the simplest way of um, avoiding SQL injection use prepared statements. If you uh, read up uh, instructions on how to avoid SQL injection, um, there are other alternatives which are provided. For example, uh, you could use third procedures and then you say call uh, with a thing uh, with, with strings uh, which are enforced as strings, um, but that is a little clumsy because you do not want to create a stored procedure for every query. Another alternative which is widely used is to write your own function or use a library function that adds quotes as above uh, before you form the query. Now, this is again uh, not recommended uh, because it is instead of doing this yourself leave it to the database to do it. Uh, prepared statement will take care of all this why do you worry about how exactly it is to be done. So, this form actually tells the system what you want rather than how to do it by escaping quotes. So, it is better to do it at a higher level. So, you should never ever take a user input and concatenate it into a string directly, you should only pass it to a database by using a prepared statement and set string set int or whatever depending on the type of the input which you got from the user. If you do this you are pretty safe from SQL injection. Now, uh, there are other vulnerabilities here um, for example, uh, passwords in scripts. Um, so, if I, I told you about the database uh, workshop hack at IITB, this was what was done actually. Um, in this case, uh, there is a PHP I think, but the same thing happens with JSP. So, these are scripts which are stored in a directory which is accessible uh, directly from the web. The only thing is that when the web server finds a file with a suffix dot JSP or dot PHP, it treats it as a program and executes it. If it finds a file with any other suffix, it simply displays the file. So, now what happens is if you edit the file in that directory with say Emacs is a ed editor which probably few people use today, but it was very popular. It creates a file with the same name with a tilde attached to it. Uh, other editors do something like uh, have a file called dot swp. So, it is something dot jsp dot swp. So, what happens is the hacker sees a particular URL. Uh, let us say file 1 uh, or dot jsp and then types in file 1 dot jsp tilde. Since it is jsp tilde the server simply displays the file and if by chance the database user id and password was actually stored directly in that file you have a problem that file has been shown to the user who now has the database user id and password and this is what actually happened in the back in 2003. So, there are a few things which you obviously need to deal with uh, to prevent this. First of all, you should never store scripts um, such as uh, Java, JSP 
in an area accessible using the basic HTTP protocol. And second, you should never store passwords in scripts, store them in config files, which are in a separate area, which even if there's any error, will never be revealed through uh, the web server. The web server does not have access to uh, that area with the password. Um, so that's, that's a basic thing which anybody developing an application has to take care of. And finally, even if the user, uh, if, if the hacker gets the database ID and password, they still have to connect to the database and make modifications there. So another basic technique which is, must be used is at the database, you list a particular set of IPs from which you can connect and execute queries. So this IP will include the application servers, but not anything else. So if a hacker tries to connect from some other IP, uh, they will not be able to execute any queries on the database. So even though they have the user ID and password, they're still not able to go and modify data unless they additionally break into the application server itself and then execute queries from there. So that's uh, a few things which any uh, application developer has to keep in mind. Okay, I think this is a good point to take a two-minute break and see if there are any questions.